For those who seek adventure, this is the Buffalo Roamer Podcast, sharing the people, places, and moments that make a life on the loose worth living. The thing that's going to stick out to you most is when they open up that plane door. The cold is something like you've never felt. The jungle is so thick. Even if you had a machete, you couldn't get through it. There's a huge blonde grizzly bear. And when it saw us, this thing put its head down, stomped on the ground, and hissed like an alligator. I just crossed this real stretch of desert, and I was really suffering. I'm your host, Will Collins. I'm an adventurer, outdoorsman, and roamer of wild places. I've backpacked the Brooks Range, rafted the Grand Canyon, and have canoed from source to sea both the Mississippi and Yukon Rivers. I live for adventure, travel, fresh air, and diving into the unknown. And now... I hope to share my passion with you on the Buffalo Roamer podcast. All right, episode 57 of Buffalo Roamer Outdoors. Here we go. Thanks for tuning in to another edition. Make sure you're subscribed if you're enjoying the podcast. Uh, just hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening. A couple things we're excited about coming up. I got some, a couple speeches this weekend at the Outdoor Adventure Expo. That's in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's put on by uh, Midwest Mountaineering, the uh, epic local gear shop uh, and outdoor adventure hub for the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Uh, I'm doing two virtual presentations there, one about my canoe trips uh, across the Yukon and Mississippi. That one's titled America by Canoe, stories, lessons, and insights from 4,300 miles across the Mississippi and Yukon. The other presentation I'll be giving is called Catch More Fish tips, tricks, and stories to catch more fish from your canoe or kayak. That one will be all about catching fish from your canoe or kayak, as you could probably guess from the title. So looking forward to uh, those speeches. That event's always fun. I've uh, done a couple there before, and then, uh, yeah, ha have a couple more coming up uh, this winter after that one as well. So at Outdoor Adventure Expo Midwest Mountaineering. It's awesome. So that'll be fun. Also, buffalorumor.com. Check it out. We got swag full sale. Hats, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all the fun stuff. Okay, today's episode, Richard Larson is on the podcast. Richard Larson goes by the trail name Skittles. He is a through hiking extraordinaire. He's done it all, done a bunch of them at least. Uh, he's been at it a long time, but his latest rendition is the Snowbird Route. Uh, this is a trail that he conceived it's uh, or, or came up with, I should say. He's uh, 5,000 miles uh, from Key West all the way up to Angle Inlet, Minnesota. If you find yourself a map of America, go find Angle Inlet. It's a cool little conundrum up there. Uh, but nonetheless, he, he through hiked this 5,000 mile trek. So without further ado, episode 57 of Buffalo Roamer Outdoors with Richard Larson. Skittles, what's going on, man? How are you? Oh, not too bad. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty great. Excited to uh, excited to connect and uh, and talk a little through hiking and uh, and traveling the country by foot because you just uh, got off quite the journey. Uh, uh, fill me in a little bit on your uh, on your snowbird route through hike and uh, and kind of the the ten thousand uh, mile view of of the trip here. Well, 10,000 is giving me a little too much credit. It was 5,000 miles. But, I, I, that's um, funny I said that. I, me I, meant, I meant a zoomed out perspective is what I meant. And then, uh, of course, when you put it in scale, 5,000 <laughs> is pretty zoomed out already. <laughs> so um, it's a route that I just kind of put together starting at the southernmost point of the continental U.S. or the contiguous U.S. to the northernmost point of the contiguous U.S. And and made for really nice starting and ending points because there's a southernmost point buoy in Key West, and they've recently built a northernmost point buoy up in the northwest angle of Minnesota. So I kind of hiked from buoy to buoy. Um, it was kind of just uh, something that was in my mind one of these winters when you're kind of dreaming about hiking and making plans. And so it's just kind of a dream one winter that I thought, well, what can I do that's unique or what route can I put together that's be different? And that was one of a few different routes I was kind of dreaming about. And I didn't really know that it would ever happen. But last November, I started hiking it and probably 90% of it is on existing trails and routes. And then the little bit, the rest of it is just kind of connecting those routes. So probably the southern third of it follows kind of the eastern continental route. Um, then there's a connector, and then the Sheltui Trace Trail in Kentucky, a little connector, and then the North Country Trail was about 2,000 miles of the route, and then another connector from the finish of that in Tower, where I left that, going up to Angle Inlet. So, wow! So, so 5,000 miles uh, from 
Key West, essentially, to the northernmost point in, in America, in continental U.S., <clears throat> which is uh, uh, is, which is kind of a goofy thing in of itself, uh, uh, that northern point, because uh, you have to go through Minis or through uh, Canada t to reach it by foot, right? Yeah, so I had to cross the border um, on foot and then walk through Manitoba for about 60 miles and then back up into the angle, which is, um, it was kind of a, um, a mapping error when they had a treaty between the U.S. and Canada and where the, you know, the border was supposed to be. They thought the Mississippi ended somewhere different than it does, and they weren't sure about, you know, they thought the Lake of the Woods was south of where the Mississippi would end, and they had kind of came up with this on the treaty, and then when they went out and looked on the ground, they found out that it wasn't what they expected. But the U.S. just ended up with this little piece of land that kind of, a little peninsula up in the corner of the Lake of the Woods, and it's kind of, yeah, a unique little spot in and of itself. And the people that live up there, you know, are, you know, very remote, um, you know, fishing. They have to come through Canada if they want to get back to the U.S. So it's a cool little place. That's funny, man. Yeah, that that, that is an interesting little uh, little place on the map. I know I, I have a big, uh, really detailed uh, map of the U.S. that I found at a thrift store in Omaha, uh, of all places, and it's like an old school that you a map that you would like pull down from the elementary school uh, uh, chalkboard, and it's super detailed. And I always that's always one of the spots that's uh, either like a gotcha spot if we're just looking at the maps with friends, or just kind of a unique, uh, unique as you said, border uh, or, or clerical air maybe. Um, well, that, that's awesome, man. That sounds like an awesome trip. Uh, how long did it take you? So it took me a little over 10 months. I left uh, November 22nd at 5 a.m. down in Key West, and I finished um, it was just a little over a week ago. October 2nd at 1.30, I finished up at the northernmost buoy. And it was kind of cool because the southernmost point, my sister and brother-in-law planned a Florida Keys vacation for when I would be starting. So they were there to help me out at the start because the Florida Keys are notorious for being difficult to camp in. Um, it's not, there's not easy to find places and you're not supposed to stealth camp and all that stuff, although people do. And I would have if my sister wasn't there, but so they helped me out with camping and with like just transportation through the Keys. And then at the finish, my parents were up there. And so they helped me out a little bit through the Canada section and were there for the finish. And that was nice. And they had offered to like drive me across the border, but I was like, no, I've I've had this in my head that I want to walk into Canada and you know, I wasn't sure if they would, you know, what they would think about me walking <laughs> into Canada. And I talked to them for a while. There were two border agents that came out and talked to me on the border when I walked in and they didn't have a problem with me walking in, but I think they were very confused about what I was doing <laughs> and why I was walking up there. Uh, as were uh, many of folk you met along the way, I have to imagine, uh, uh, I imagine that you just ran into all kinds of, of people throughout the country. Yeah, and a lot of the places I was hiking on other trails, like the Sheltui Trace in Kentucky or the Florida Trail, so people didn't think that it was odd when they saw me there. They didn't usually know what I was doing. Um, but in northern Minnesota, there was a stretch where I was kind of just walking forest roads through state forests, and I was running into a lot of hunters out there. And some of them would stop and talk to me, but others would drive by and just give you the weirdest looks like, why is there somebody backpacking out here? What are they doing? Uh, that's funny, man. That's neat. So 10 months, 5,000 miles from Key West all the way up to, is it Angle Inlet? Is that right? Yeah, Angle Inlet. Angle Inlet, northernmost in the continental U.S., uh, quite the through hike, uh, 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 creating your own kind of trail and, and, uh, and connecting trails to get there. What led you to this path of uh, of this route and this uh, this through hiking scene? I imagine this maybe isn't your first one. No, I've been through hiking since 2004. I've done most of the long trails in the U.S. and around the world. I've been in New Zealand and Costa Rica and Patagonia and um, a few other places. So I've done a lot of long distance hikes and. I used to be a sports writer, and actually that's what I'm going back into. So every time I do a long-distance hike, people keep asking me, are you going to write a book about that? And I'm like, well, there's already 100 books out there about the Appalachian Trail. What am I going to write that's any different? And so I think 
part of that was the motivation for doing this. I wanted to do something that was unique that as far as I know, nobody has ever done before in, in history. I mean, nobody has hiked it. And if you look historically, nobody would have walked from Key West to Angle Inlet. If they traveled that way, they would have done most of it by boat. So I think, you know, that was impetus just to do something that was unique and different from maybe anything else that's been done before. And now maybe uh, my family has been pressuring me. So I kind of am committed to writing a book now, I guess about it. So. <laughs> oh, great. Well, I'll be looking forward to it and uh, I'll be interested to, to hear how that, uh, that process goes. Uh, how was this trail or this trip different than some of the other journeys that you've had uh, in the past since, since 04, since you've been, uh, since you've been clocking miles? Well, I guess probably the biggest difference was just the amount of time. Being out there for for 10 months is really a long time. You know, the Appalachian Trail and the Continental Divide Trail and Pacific Crest Trail were all around five months. So about, you know, half the length of time and then about, you know, half the distance. And so you're kind of spending a summer out there on those other trails where this trail felt like basically I spent the entire year hiking and it really does become your life. I mean, that's all I was doing just about every day. I'd take a few zero days, but otherwise every day I just get up and walk 15 to 20 miles. And, you know, it, it's going to actually be, you know, I feel like I'm still taking a break now, but it's going to be a little different going back into the work world and, you know, working daily and not out hiking daily. It's going to feel different, but it really, I mean, long distance hiking in general is a lifestyle and, you know, I did the Appalachian Trail in 2004 and just became addicted or they say that it ruined me because it changed <laughs> my life. Um, and, you know, this was just kind of an extension of that. And honestly, people were asking, well, are you, were you tired? Did you want to finish when you're done? And I finished and it was really cool to finish. But then as we were driving back, like, it was just a gorgeous fall day up there. And I was thinking, man, I kind of would like to just be out there walking again. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's uh, and you're just a week out from from finishing. You said, right? Yeah, it's just the last well, last Sunday, so a little bit over a week. Yeah. How has uh, that process been for you? I know sometimes that can be a uh, uh, tricky transition, and going back into uh, not as you said, l lugging the pack on and hiking 15 miles every day. Yeah, it's well. This has been weird because actually. I've had a bit of notoriety about this. There's been a few newspapers and um, the Lake of the Woods uh, tourism guy, Joe Henry, who works up there and I'd been in contact with, he kind of was in contact with different newspapers and TV and stuff. So I've done, I think, four newspaper interviews and I was on TV once and now I'm doing your podcast. So that's been very different. Usually you just finish a hike and it's kind of over <laughs> and you kind of go on to what's next. So I've been able to relive this a little bit, which is fun. And, um, you know, I enjoy talking about the hiking. So your route going from Key West up to, uh, angle inlet. Um, it's kind of a, uh, obviously we've said this is it, it's not a, a quote unquote sanctioned through hike or however you want to say it. It's, it's a, <laughs> a bit of your own route. Uh, but it's a unique route as well in that, I don't, I don't feel that that's a very well traveled corridor of the country. Um, you have the East coast, the West coast, uh, maybe the Midwest, the Mississippi, that area, but it's almost like a little bit of a, it's like the rust belt almost a little bit between the two. It, it's how did you find, uh, uh, traveling through that, that area of the country? Yeah, it was, it's different country than most of what I've hiked through before. Um, Really, the only part that I had hiked before was the Southern Appalachians. Um, so it, it was unique. Um, some of the places are really amazing, and some of the places you probably wouldn't hike if you weren't, you know, doing a through hike. So, you know, basically Western Ohio is a lot of farmland. It's it's a beautiful country in its own right, but it's not necessarily the place that you would plan, you know, a backpacking trip to if you weren't connecting something else up. Um, but so much variety in the landscape from going through the Florida Keys where you're hiking these historic bridges between the Keys and then getting onto the Florida Trail and you're walking in the Big Cypress Swamp for 10 miles where you have thigh deep water for the entire 10 miles and there's alligators and cotton mouse or water moccasins around you and 
Um, and then like getting up in Alabama, I don't even know if I've ever been in Alabama before, but now I hiked across the state and some of these areas that were new to me were surprisingly beautiful. The Pinhoti Trail, the Alabama portion of it, gorgeous country down there with the pines and, you know, the hills and stuff that they have there. And then one of my favorite areas of the country, I think, is the Southern Appalachians where um, the Appalachian Trail starts. And I didn't, I wasn't on the Appalachian Trail much. I chose to do the Benton Mackay Trail instead. And they kind of parallel each other down in that area. But Nobody hikes the Bit Mackay Trail and everybody hikes the Appalachian <laughs> Trail, so you don't see. The time I was down there, they were saying that all the shelters on the Appalachian Trail were overcrowded, like more than 20 people at every shelter. Wow. And I think I saw three other people through hiking when I was on the Bit Mackay Trail. So, <laughs> you know, it's you to do a different route. <laughs> and then um, Kentucky was a surprise to me also with just – you know, the arches and the different landforms that they have in um, eastern Kentucky, I really didn't know about. I'd never really traveled in that part of the country before what, either. What is it like there? Um, it has the second most arches in the U.S. after the Utah. Really? Which you think about. And um, it's pretty remote. It's kind of like Appalachia a little bit with the hills and um, fairly deep river valleys. You go through the Red River Valley is one of them that you go to through on the Sheltui Trace. You go by Cumberland Falls. Um, Big South Fork is the area where you first start, and that's where a few of the more major arches and different cliff formations and waterfalls and stuff are. It's, it's very scenic, and I, I would certainly recommend that as you know part of the country to people go see if you're not. I don't know that people that that's on your radar that much to go hiking in that area, but I, I would know. recommend that. Absolutely. It's great. I love, uh, I love learning about new areas and, sh and shedding light on new areas. It reminds me a little bit, uh, at least from your description and kind of the underappreciate underappreciatedness of it, of, uh, the driftless area of Wisconsin, uh, oh, yeah. like Illinois, Iowa, that area is, uh, is special in, in my heart and, and sounds kind of similar, especially from an underappreciated aspect too. Yeah. That's another spot. I don't think anybody outside of the Driftless area really has heard about it or knows about it as a place to go explore. But it's a fascinating place to even just drive around through all the different valleys and stuff there. It's really a pretty cool area. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. So you're traveling up through Kentucky, uh, surprising beauty of Kentucky, uh, and then work with me here. So you're coming uh, up north and you're going through Tennessee? So... After So I went through Tennessee before Kentucky, right. um, across it, and then hit Kentucky. And then um, after Kentucky, I crossed the Ohio River, which was about the halfway point for me, and joined the North Country Trail, which is also the Buckeye Trail in Ohio, and kind of swung towards western Ohio and went up. It's a lot of the old canal trails, the old Miami Canal and the uh, I think there's another canal and it kind of follows those old canal routes. Um, a lot of farmland through there and then into southern Michigan is a lot of farmland too. And then kind of about halfway up through lower Michigan, you start getting back into national and state forests and some more kind of wooded, more beautiful country for backpacking in. And then the part of the trail I had been looking forward to almost the entire hike was the upper peninsula of Michigan across northern Wisconsin and then through northern Minnesota you hike the Superior Hiking Trail and then the border route and the Keck which are two trails that cut across um, the Boundary Waters canoe area. So all of that area is pretty fantastic too. It's you know kind of smaller mountains and you know the cliffs and around Lake Superior and then I think you're familiar with the Boundary Waters which you know as a place that I went to as a kid that has a special place in my heart and I don't think before I looked up at this trail, I didn't realize that you could actually just walk straight across it, you know, huh. I didn't even Grand Marais to the Gunflint to Ely, you just walk straight through huh. the middle. So. That's awesome. That That's, that's, that's really neat. And yeah, uh, a beautiful, beautiful area of the country. No doubt about it. It's funny. I just, uh, got off of a river trip, uh, yesterday. We just got back from a trip to Moab, Utah and, uh, awesome group of people, uh, funny in that, uh, and unique, I think in that it was, we had one person from New York City, we had one person from LA, 
we had two people from San Diego and then myself and one other guy from the Midwest. And uh, just funny talking and, and everybody got along great, just an, an absolutely amazing trip. Uh, but it's funny talking to the guy from San Diego. He was like, dude, you cannot come to California and tell tell people to re- recommend people uh, a vacation to the Midwest. They they look at you like you're crazy, even though he, <laughs> even though he knows that it's it's beautiful and amazing. He's like, I try and tell people to 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 go to the Midwest, and it's like you're uh, you know talking to a brick wall or something. <laughs> yeah, it's a different landscape. I mean, I've I worked for nine years in the North Cascades in the Lake Chelan area of Washington, and you know the mountains there are grand and impressive and just kind of jaw-dropping, awe-inspiring. And a lot of what you see here is a, a little more subdued, but I feel like, you know, when you're in the Boundary Waters hiking, you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. Like you're just, you know, off on your own in the country. And, um, and I, you know, I love the, you know, the pine forests and the lakes and the, the craggy area that you have up there. So, it's yeah, it's it's just a different kind of beauty, but I I think it's just as spectacular as anywhere else, really. Yeah, I would have to agree. What was your uh, or what is your your style of hiking? Uh, you said you're going roughly about 15 miles a day. How heavy is your pack? How long are you stopping, or how uh, often are you popping into towns or doing resupplies? So my my pack with food and water is about 30 pounds. My base weight's somewhere around 16 to 18 without food and water. Um, as far as long distance hikers go, that's probably a little bit on the heavier side, but in the realm of what most people that do long distance hikes, I'm a, a bigger guy and I go slower than some of the people that are doing, you know, super long hikes. A lot of them will do 25 to 30 miles a day and I don't hike fast enough to do that, but I'll do 15 to 20 miles pretty much every day. I can hike two and a half miles an hour all day long and not get tired if i'm if i try to like push it to three miles i'll get exhausted but if i just do the pace that i'm comfortable at i can just pretty much walk that pace all day long um and then probably every five six days i'll get into a town and i just resupply along the way most of the way there were a couple spots that i sent food drops that were very remote but otherwise you know i'll just buy what i need out of the gas station or you know the small grocery stores or a lot of little towns now have a dollar general which is you know reasonable to resupply out of and probably twice a month i would take a day off or a zero day in town and spend a day in a hotel and i love when i'm relaxing or taking time off the trail i love like just doing absolutely nothing (laughs) so i'll I'll go lay on the hotel bed and watch ESPN or watch TV like all day long and watch sports and order pizza and maybe not leave the hotel at all. I'll get the (laughs) room that's right across from the laundry so that I don't have to go very far to do laundry or, you know, when, when I'm relaxing, I want to do absolutely nothing because in the other days you're, you know, walking for 10 to 12 hours a day. (laughs) Funny, you've earned it, right? (laughs) Yeah. So, and it's just, it's fun to, you know, I think that's part of what I think you get out of doing some of these long distance hikes is you're going without some of the conveniences of life. But then when you get back into a place where they're available, that seems so much better. Like you can go jump in a hot shower. How fantastic is that? Or you have running water from the spigot that you can just, you know, drink and not have to get it from, you know, some of these swamps or rivers that I had to get water out of. So a hundred percent. Yeah. It's, it, it's, I, I know exactly what you mean. It puts such great perspective on the things that we so often take for granted and don't even think about electricity, water, uh, mm-hmm. a roof over your head, all the basics, right? Yeah. Being able to get away from the mosquitoes. And go <laughs> check yourself yeah, inside. There you go. That's, a, that's crucial. Um, uh, I, Go Based on when I did this hike, I went through the winter and early spring, so I really didn't have bugs or mosquitoes until I got to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and then they were horrible. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> so I had them for about a month and a half, and then they were gone by the time I kind of got up into northern Minnesota again. So that was kind of nice. I thought I might have to deal more with bugs than I did, but it worked out pretty good timing-wise. That's great. So how about... Uh... Did you have to adjust or, or uh, 
make any changes along the way as you went? Uh, you know, when you start on the journey, you have this vision of, of exactly how it's going to go. Uh, was that generally how it went or how did you adjust as you, as you went? Well, I would say that when I started the journey, I did not know exactly how it would go. <laughs> um, I didn't have a lot of the route finalized. I was kind of doing it as I was hiking. I knew in general which trails I was going to connect up and stuff. And I think the fact that I've done a lot of long distance hiking previously, I kind of knew that I could throw my stuff in the backpack and just start walking and and be okay and plan it out as I go. All you need to really know is where your next water is on a quicker basis, like where you can get water and where you're going to camp that night. And then a little bit more longer term, where's the next town stop that I can resupply out of? And like the route that I was doing through northern Minnesota, I had no idea where I was going when I started this trail. There was a, well, that tourism director I talked to, Joe Henry up there, he put me in touch with a guy who's in charge of, I think, a snowmobile club. And I didn't talk to him until I was in Michigan. And I finally got a hold of him about two months before I got to that area and he was fantastic because I just told him, well, I'm going to be going from this place to this place. If it was you, what route would you take? And he just knew that area, like, you know, the back of his hand. Without looking at a map, he was telling me, well, I'd take this road, and then I'd go this road, and that's 11 <laughs> miles to here, and you could camp here, and there's a shelter here. And he just he was the perfect person to talk to to get the details of that route. And when I had kind of looked at a map, it would have been similar to what he told me, but just having somebody that, you know, is a local up there and can tell you that, yeah, that's the way to go, you know, worked out perfect. That's so. great. How much of your, your journey or your, your trip was uh, road versus trail versus other surface or, or other, uh, yeah, dirt road or trail or, yeah. Yeah, so I've been saying that about 90% of it was established routes, like the Florida Trail, the Pinhoti, the Benton Mackay, the Chautui Trace and the North Country Trail. But then large sections of those routes or those trails, especially the North Country, you do have a lot of paved bike trails or road walking that are part of that. So they're not like 100% single track trail. I would guess, and I hadn't really like put it down on paper, but I would guess probably somewhere around 65%, about two thirds of it was probably actual trail, trail tread or very remote two track type road that, you know, seems like trail. And then the rest of it probably was split evenly between paved roads or gravel roads. Um, The longest section of road I had was at the very end when I was going from Tower, Minnesota to Angle Limit. That was probably 90% road, but probably two thirds of that was really backcountry gravel roads in the middle of nowhere that nobody drives except for some hunters when they're hunting. So it still felt fairly remote. The paved highways that you walk are not that great. Um, and some of the more, one of the bigger problems is road walking is that you have to deal with people's dogs. People always ask you if you have any bad wildlife encounters, you know, cause you know, alligators or bears or anything like that. I don't really worry about the wildlife, but people that have aggressive dogs, when you're walking on the roads, you'd have pit bulls or Rottweilers or other aggressive, you know, terriers that come out after you. And that's a little scary. And I did have one um, kind of attack in Northern Kentucky where I got surrounded by seven dogs of different breeds. And one of them kind of lightly bit my thigh. It didn't, it just barely broke the skin. It wasn't a huge puncture, but the guy who owned that place came out and he called the dogs off at that point. Otherwise I'm not exactly sure what would have happened. And up until that point, I felt pretty confident, you know, like I'm a big guy. I'm pretty assertive when I see dogs and I can face them and yell at them. And I, they really didn't scare me that much. Although I had quite a few dog encounters before that. But then after that one, I think like it got to me a little bit because then the next time I saw any dogs, it kind of had like little flashbacks and you're thinking about it a little bit more. And it took me it took me a few weeks before I felt a little bit calmer about running into dogs again. But and then, you know, I, so you look up stories on stuff when stuff like that happens and there's people quite often that are killed by dogs or have, you know, attacks and 
they kill more people in the U.S. than bears do or some of the other animals sure. that you might be more afraid of. So yeah. that was definitely, you know, if you want a negative aspect of this trail, that was the negative aspect. Was seven. The, seven it, dogs surrounding you. That that sounds spooky. Yeah. It was, I mean, you're prepared if you have one aggressive dog. You can face it. You have your pepper spray or whatever. You can, you feel like you can handle that. And two, still a pretty good, but. Once you start getting multiple, it's <laughs> you're like, well, what do you do? You can't be facing all of the dogs, <laughs> you know. So what that was uh, a pretty scary situation. That sounds like it. What um, was there any moment where you were where you or, or what was the point? I guess where you thought you were most either out there or uh, or kind of off the beaten path along the journey. But I do think the most remote place was through the Boundary Waters, the border route trail that goes between Grand Marais and Gunflint Lodge, and then the Keck, which kind of goes between Gunflint and Ely, felt like the most remote. It was a place where I had cell service the least, which <laughs> I'm surprised these days. You can feel like you're in the middle of the wilderness and, and turn on your phone and you're like, oh, I have three bars of cell service or whatever. And it kind of frustrates me at times because I'll be in camp and I kind of want to read or just relax. But when I have cell service and I'm checking out sports scores or I'm online the entire night and it ruins the wilderness a little bit for me, but you have that addiction where if it's available, you're like in contact with people and stuff. And so I did enjoy the parts where you do get away from civilization completely. It really, you know, I yeah. think adds to the hype. I, uh, as I mentioned, just got off this trip yesterday. It was uh, in Utah. It was five days, four nights, and there was a, a group of uh, six of us. And I, coming off of the trip, uh, it was in a real steep canyon uh, where there's no cell service. <clears throat> and coming off the trip, you know, as soon as cell service pops back on, all of us, uh, one, 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 uh, girl on the trip actually lost her phone. So, uh, but as soon as everybody else got back on, you know, we're all checking the phone, checking all the updates. Meanwhile, she's sitting there watching all of us check the updates, fe <laughs> feeling like crap because she lost her phone. But uh, w one of the things that makes it unique in this trip in specific, I think, is that there's no cell service because, it, you know, it's such a group kind of bonding for lack of a better term uh, a trip because you're only there focused on the immediate surroundings the group that you're with mm -hmm. and, and you know you're sitting around the campfire sharing stories you're not buried in your phone uh doing whatever and i, and I think that is a big piece of the of the uh you know of the pie as to why why some of those trips are are so special yeah you're so much more in the moment, you're so much more involved in where you are and what is happening to you when you don't have those outside distractions. And I'm talking about everybody being on their cell phone when she got in there. The last nine years before I started doing this hiking last year and this year, I was working for the Forest Service, and he said, in Chelan. And where we worked up lake, we had no cell service. So our Forest Service crew would go in for eight days, no cell service. And then we'd be taking the ferry down lake and there's a point on the ferry where you get back into cell service and we'd be playing cards or hanging out and, you know, doing stuff as a trail crew. As soon as the phones started pinging, we're all just buried back in our phones and I was included. I yeah, mean, I can't, absolutely. Like disparage anybody else because I was doing it too, but it's, it's such a weird it culture is. that we now where you're just so obsessed with your phone versus what you know, real life or the people around you. So totally. Um, yeah. And I, I know, uh, I, I think I, a sentiment that I picked up on some, uh, on some of my trips as well. And it so sounds like you have as well is like, there's so much de 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 divisiveness out there and so much in the news media tries to like, you know, convince you that your neighbor or that your, uh, you know, the, the state next to you or whatever it might be is, is bad. But I found so much good in just like talking to people of all walks of life. I found that's one of the cool things about these trips, like we've mentioned. Uh, you found that as well? Yeah, definitely. And I probably am a bit more liberal or independent, more liberal on the side of it. And I think most of the people I was going through a lot of, you know, rural areas of the country that 
tends to be, you know, a lot more conservative or Republican, but, and I know that some of the people that were helping me out that I know that our political views are probably different. And I think the problem now is that you're told that if somebody has a different political view from them, they're like your enemy or, you know, somebody you can't talk to or have any discussions with. And, you know, but when you're hiking and you're just meeting these people face to face and talking to them, I mean, we've got to be able to talk to each other, you know, and we still have a lot of stuff in common and a lot of great stuff out there. And so, yeah, you certainly, you know, you get past those barriers that you see by on social media or on comment sections and stuff where you just see all this hate and stuff spewed. Whereas when you're talking to people in person and, you know, people you've never met before and you don't know their background, they don't know your background, but you can just share this shared experience. And yeah, I think, like kind of what I've been saying is I think our country looks a lot better at ground level, you know, than it does, you know, through the internet. Yeah, no doubt about that. I, I, I would, you know, you hit the nail on the head with that one. Um, how about any interesting folk met along the way? Kind of, kind of along that line. Does anybody come to mind who had a, uh, an interesting story? Um, I'm trying to think what I had for interesting. There's, there was a guy that I hiked with for a little while in um, Florida, uh, Jesse Bader, and he was just doing a Florida long distance hike, and then he was going over to do Arizona. But he was, he was somebody who was hiking for St. Jude's, so he was doing a fundraiser along the way, and so I kind of found that interesting. I had debated about doing my hike as a fundraiser, but I was just was too lazy to get anything <laughs> set up, I guess. So, but it was fun to talk to him and find out his background and how he ended up you know, hiking and doing it as raising. And I think he raised like $25,000 between wow. those two. Hikes. So it was pretty amazing. Um, I didn't, you know, specifically hike with too many people for long stretches of time. I did have a friend that came down who I didn't really know her. We had a mutual friend and she was interested in hiking and part of the Penhody and heard that I was out there. So we joined up for, you know, a week. Um, and actually talking about that, where we started was uh, Flag Mountain, and there's a guy there that you've probably heard of, Nimble Wool Nomad, was the caretaker at Flag Mountain when we were there. So we got to spend a night with him, and he made us dinner and told us all kinds of stories. He's the, um, well, he's the founder, basically, or he's the one that made the Eastern Continental Trail popular. He's the oldest hiker to have ever finished the Appalachian Trail. Just a few years back, he did it at something like 83 years old or wow. somewhere in his 80s. and. He's got a few books out there and has written poetry that's kind of like the Robert Service type of poetry with that kind of rhyming, outdoor exploring awesome. type background. So he, he was a lot of fun to meet and just to have that experience. Um, and does he, uh, does he have a place along one of the trails? So he was being, he lived for a while at Nimble Little Gap, which was a place along the Appalachian Trail, which is where he took his name from. But he was... Um, there's a state park at Flag Mountain where the Pinotti Trail starts and they have some cabins and he was just the caretaker of those cabins. And so I stayed in one of the cabins and then we went and visited him in his house up there. And so That's that neat. was fun. Um, I was thinking, I was going to mention, I didn't see him on this hike, although we communicated a little bit because he always sends me birthday messages, but I know Another hiker that's been mentioned on some of your other podcasts, partly because he does a lot of canoeing and a lot of biking, and he's done more adventuring than anybody else I've ever heard of, is one gallon, Bill Netterman. Oh, yeah. I know, I know that you and a Greybeard had talked about him, and he's probably, from all of my hiking, he might be one of the most fascinating people that I've ever ran into. Yeah, he's, he's just... I think he's on. Uh, he's he just pushed off on a new one. I saw recently. I think I, I don't know where I saw it, but uh, I saw somewhere that somebody had connected with him or that he was he was uh, cutting a new a new journey at the moment. I think. Yeah, I can't remember. So he sends me on my my birthday's August twenty first, and he always sends me a birthday message. Like, and I think he does this to a lot of people. And then usually that's when I like respond back and say, "Hey, where are you? Or what adventure sure. are you on now?" And it's always. A different adventure and he's done all of the triple crown trails in the u.s the appalachian trail pacific crest and continental divide trail he's done all of them four times and just doing them once is a lot he's done just as much you know 
kayaking or canoeing, you know, down the Mississippi and the reverse trip of Lewis and Clark. He's done the Yukon. He's done a bunch of trips up in Canada. And then he's also done all those long distance biking trips that I don't know about. So he's, <laughs> he's a fascinating person to try to, he, he'll talk to you a lot. He's a big talker, but he's under the radar. He's never totally. like in any media or backpack or anything like that. So the only people that know of him are you know other long distance travelers are the only other people i hear about him but i think he's a fascinating individual you so. bet Where, where'd you run across him so i met him the first time on the pacific crest trail and actually i met him and another kind of legend of the pacific crest trail billy goat i met the two of them the same day i've heard of billy and goat they, as well from uh from another uh podcast guest on the pct yeah he used to hike um the PCT like every year for about 20 straight years. And he's got probably 40 or 50,000 miles under him. I don't know how many there's a, an award. Um, the Florida trail actually has Billy goat days. They have a little celebration in Orlando. Cause I guess he's famous on the Florida trail too, for doing that all the time in the winter. And he's probably around 70 now. I'm not sure, but there is an award that you can get. If you have 25,000 hiking miles, you can get a Billy goat award and, <laughs> I should probably apply for that because I do have that many miles down and it'd be a fun award to have. That's funny. But so I met those two guys on the exact same day on the Pacific Crest Trail and have hiked with them a little bit here and there. And then there was a time when I was hiking the Arizona Trail and I had hiked up from um, Roosevelt Marina on a lake in the middle of the trail. I'd hiked up after dark hiking this road because I wanted to get some extra miles in and hiked maybe an hour after dark and then set up camp. And as I was setting up camp, I see this headlamp bobbing up the trail and it's like, wow, so somebody's still out of here hiking later than me. And he gets up to where camp is and I can't see who it is because it's pitch black. And I hear this voice, which is one gallon has this very distinctive voice. And so this voice calls out like, Hey, do you mind if I camp here? And I'm like, one gallon. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just randomly ran into him on the Arizona trail and we hiked together for four or five days. That's there, cool, man. So. Yeah, it's funny how that works. Uh, uh, it's a it's a small kind of community, and, and if you're if you're out there a lot, uh, there's a good chance that you could run into somebody. And that's one of the cool things too uh, uh, about these different communities is you know if you live either anywhere on a river or on a near a trail system or near mountains. It's like, there's a chance that one of these characters could stop into your town and, uh, and you, you know, just be an unsuspecting, uh, a person hanging out and, and they could just pop up, you know? Yeah. I do think it'd be fun at some point if I ever settle down somewhere to have a place near one of these trails, maybe not the Appalachian trail cause that's too busy, but some of the less busier trails and, just have the experience maybe to give back to some of the hikers and, you know, to be able to share that experience with them too and have them share what they're doing. Would I think it'd be fun to kind of live along one of those trails. It would be. And yeah, you do get to know when you're long distance hiking, you get to know other people that are kind of doing similar things as you. And I, a lot of people that probably think my lifestyle is a little weird because I'm hiking all the time and I basically work just to save up money to hike. But it doesn't seem weird to me because I have all these other friends that are out doing stuff. Um, my friend Buck 30 is doing a hike in the desert right now. And I have a friend, um, Heather Steady, who she's um, just finishing up the National Scenic 11. So there's 11 National Scenic Trails in the U.S., like the big three and then Arizona Trail and Florida Trail and a bunch of lesser known, like small ones. And she's going to be probably like the seventh or eighth person to finish all 11 and she'll be the second woman to finish all 11. But I have, you know, and then one gallon or whatever, I have all these friends that are always out doing these adventures. So it, it kind of seems normal to me. This is what, you know, the people I know do. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I found the same thing, especially uh, through this podcast, talking with people. It's, it's, you know, it's funny because it seems a little less, uh, like you said, yeah, it seems like more commonplace, you know, now when I, when I think about paddling the Mississippi river, like it's not, it's not the same way I thought of it in 2017 before I had gone and, and did it, you know, it's now it's like, oh yeah, I know all these people have done it. It's an awesome trip. We have this little community and, and it's, uh, it's, you know, it's still a pretty small world, but when you're living mm -hmm. in it, it seems like uh, it it's, has more tentacles than you expect, right? 
Yeah. And I was thinking you were talking about just going back in history from thinking how things changed to like when I first hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2004 and then the PCT in 05 and the CGT in 06. They didn't have smartphones back then. <laughs> and, um, we had, you know, you had to rely on your paper map and your compass and there weren't there weren't as many people out there. It does seem like it's gotten a bit more popular, especially the main trails and the Mississippi. I think more and more people are canoeing the Mississippi. It's kind of become a bigger thing. And just the changes, you know, now a lot of the trails, you can just download the far out app and you've got this app that shows you a red line exactly where you're supposed to walk and tells you where the resupply options are. And in many ways it makes things really simple and easy but in other ways, sometimes I miss not knowing because a lot of times it was fun to just to find out, you know, when you get into town, what's there, or, you know, what's going to be there. And um, But in other ways, like this new technology is helpful, too, because there are some places where I'd be doing road walks where there wasn't like a lot of public land and you had to figure out where you're going to camp. So you could look on Google Earth and see, OK, there's a bunch of houses here, so I don't want to stay there, but there's a big pine plantation up there that looks like that'd be a good camp. So you could just scout out camping spots as you're walking along too, which makes things easier. So, you know, there's a lot of pluses to, to technology, but there's minuses too. So it's, yeah, it's know, give and take. Yeah, it's a little bit of everything. I think the biggest thing is we're just too, uh, and as, as we said earlier, myself, 100% guilty. We're just too... Uh, too reliant and too sucked into it. It's great to be able to use that stuff as a tool to only use those necessary things. But the problem is we're not just using it for those things. We're using it for all the <laughs> other, all the, all the other stuff that comes with it too, you know? Yeah. We keep joking about that. They're going to come out with the Google glasses again and you'll be able to download the far out app or whatever. So you'll just be able to look through your glasses and there'll be a red line in your glass <laughs> and you'll just be walking along following that. And they'll be telling you what the things are as you're walking along. Like, and, uh. It's kind of a joke, but I actually could see that eventually happening. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. What what uh, did you have a favorite? And I know you mentioned uh, Kentucky was surprisingly beautiful. The Boundary Waters. Did did you have a favorite uh, section or or a favorite uh, part of this hike? Um. Well, I guess like the sections I said that I mentioned, but also um, the Big Cypress Swamp, which we talked about a little bit too. But that was just I wouldn't want to hike that more than I did. <laughs> like it's a 30 mile section and um, there's a 10 mile spot in the middle that's completely water. And that was enough of it. But the experience out there was, I've never hiked through anything like that before. The cypress swamp with the, the egrets and the birds and you know the different wildlife that's down there. I felt like I was walking through a National Geographic episode. And huh. So it was really you know a fun kind of cool experience. And I would say a lot of Florida was that way for me. I enjoyed hiking through it once. I really probably don't have a desire to go back and redo it, but And why do you say that? It was different. Well, you know, I, I think it was stuff that was interesting and unique once one time. Like the landscape was cool to see once, but it's not like walking through a swamp isn't something you really want to do all the time and the southern part of florida when i was down there was still pretty hot and humid and not you know i like cooler temperatures and stuff too and the landscape it's pretty flat and it's not the thing that makes it interesting is that they have the unique flora and fauna down there but now that i've experienced it once i think there's other places although that in general that's the way i am i don't really like going back and redoing <laughs> stuff i like to go explore new places and do sure. new trails so what what um, um what was like what what's the logistics of hiking through a cypress swamp cuz a that doesn't really sound possible and and b I, i'm imagining like uh like wooden camping platforms or something i don't know so there's a couple of really small what they call pine islands and they're just a a couple feet higher than the rest of the cypress swamp and so you hike till you get to one of those islands and there's no place to take a break other than those islands but you get to one and then you can just walk in through this little like tunnel of brush you walk up into this island and they've usually cleared out a small spot in the middle of it that you could camp at or at least take a break at and, and so you're walking uh on a, on a on a road on a trail literally through the swamp the, literally through the swamp there is a trail underneath i mean they cleared it 
so that you can walk, that there's a path and it's very well marked. There's these orange blazes all the way. And it, it's basically part of the Everglades. And that area during the summer and when it's hotter, it actually, the water goes away and drains. And so if you hiked it, say, in June, which you'd never would do because you'd die of the heat, but um, you could walk through there without there being any water. Um, huh. So the the landscape just changes based on the time of year and after they've had their monsoon rains. Like Like right now after Hurricane Ian, it's probably so deep that you couldn't hike it at all. Um, I'm sure it's probably just deep if, you know, right. you probably end up swimming it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you wanted to take a break between Pine Islands, you could, you could take your pack off and like hang it on one of those cypress trees. You couldn't really sit down anywhere, but you could at least get your pack off your back for, you know, a minute or two if you wanted a, a slight break. But, wild, wild. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you mentioned the dogs. Uh, what other challenges or, uh, or uh, tough, did you have any tough days or what, what challenges might you, might you have faced? Yeah, I think, you know, if you're out there hiking for 10 months, you're always going to have some bad days. And it, it's often hard to say what causes them and what causes you to come out of them. But there was a few times where I was feeling less enthusiastic about hiking or, you know, a little bit just down about the trail and not that excited about it. And, you know, it would last for a day or two, whether it was just bad weather or, you know, rough trail or just just not feeling that energetic for that day. You'd have episodes where you didn't feel great. And then something would happen where you meet somebody and talk to them or the sun is shining or you just see this cool landscape or something just helps pick you up or you just happen to have a, a good day where you do, you know, 25 miles or whatever that you feel good about or something like that. Um, but there was definitely, I'm sure there was four or five times where I was feeling a little bit like, yeah, I'm not that excited about the trail right now, but the most of the days I felt really good about it. I think if you went too long, not feeling good about a trail, like if you went for a week or more, there's probably there's no reason to keep on going if you're not enjoying it, but I just enjoy, it's such a simple lifestyle. Like you stress free for the most part, you know, you're not worrying about things. You're just seeing new country every day and just, you have this set plan ahead of you for the next day. Like, okay, I'm going to hike 17 miles to this camp and this is what's along the way. Like you'd kind of look at the night before and it's just, it's kind of magical to me just to be out there and be able to do that. And um, so I knew when I was having bad days, I, I knew from my prior experience that I would enjoy it, you know, continuing. I'd always told people if they ask like, you know, what's the secret to doing a long distance hike to me, the secret is just to want to be out there more than you want to be anywhere else. Um, great way to physically, your body will get in shape to do it physically and logistically. You can figure out all that stuff. It's, it's always mentally, like, you, you know, if mentally you are excited about it and want to continue, then it's great. And, you know, if mentally you get to a point, and, and some people do, and that's fine, you know, if you get to a point mentally where you're just done with a hike, then you're done. You got what you wanted out of it, and it's time to go do something else. Yeah, so. absolutely, absolutely. Well, hey, Skittles, man, it's it's been a real blast uh, uh, chatting with you. I'm going to kind of wind her down here, but uh, what uh, you said you're heading up to uh, to catch a can to uh, to catch a, a paper gig, right? Yeah. So I've worked for a newspaper up there a few times in the past as a sports writer, and they know that I'm kind of a nomadic person, and the publisher up there whenever they have a sports editor that leaves, they'll often just check in with me and see what I'm up to. And um, they had checked in with me back in like June or July. And I said, well, if you can wait till October, I'll be up there. And they were willing to wait. Um, and they've actually, we've made a, a rough plan that will hopefully last at least for a few years, but doing working nine months and I'll have next summer off June, July, August, and then work, you know, nine months again. So, maybe they can get somebody that will stay for a while and I'll still be able to do my nomadic wanderings in the summer. So we'll, we'll see how that works, but we're going to try it out for a couple of years anyways. Awesome, man. That, that sounds great. Well, uh, I think we emailed a little bit about it, but yeah, we'll have to connect you with my buddy up there. Um, Jeff Lund. Oh, yeah. uh, Jeff Lund. I definitely want to 
touch base with him. Yeah, he's he's a good dude. He's been on the podcast a couple times and uh, outdoorsman and uh, a teacher and a journalism writer and uh, a journalism teacher and uh, I think he does a column for the Juno Express too. So yeah, you guys will you guys will fit right in. <laughs> Yeah, maybe he can get me out there fishing. That'd be a good thing to do up there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, Skittles, really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, a- any last thoughts or uh, anything to leave us with? Um, no, just if you have a kind of if you have a dream or if you have a a plan that you want to put in motion, you know, just go for it. Because I until I actually stepped foot on this trail, I didn't really know that I was going to do it. And even while I was hiking, I didn't know I was going to finish. But it worked out great and i had a fantastic time the whole way and you know getting to meet people and getting to do podcasts afterwards it's been it's been a whole wonderful experience i've really enjoyed it one step in front of the other right yep and there you have it episode 57 with richard larson aka skittles on buffalo rummer outdoors Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast if you enjoyed the show. Another big way you can help us uh, is by leaving a review or a five-star rating on either Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you are currently listening. If you leave a review or comment, it helps the show out a lot. So please go ahead and do that. Also, check out buffaloroamer.com for some of those sweatshirts, t-shirts, hats, stickers uh what else that's it go enjoy some fresh air get outside winter is here but uh, hopefully you can still find something to do to stay active and outside